College football nerds here to talk Clemson and Ohio State, round one in the playoffs. And I know y'all missed us because we read your tweets and your angry YouTube comments. Um, y'all, we're going to get into something a little bit different a little bit later into this episode. Basically, talking unit versus unit uh, discussion. And if we mess up something, bear with us. It's not nearly as egregious of a mistake as when I mess up an info card, a schedule, a stat here or there. That's probably going to happen too. Uh, Josh, before we get into discussing units and discussing the model, I want to talk about this overarching theme with Clemson this year and how I have a theory that Ohio State has a little bit of it too. Um, we always, we, we've praised Ohio State this year for handling their business. And that's why we've had them number one uh, for most of the year. We don't necessarily care how many elite teams they've beaten, how many bad teams they've beaten. They've killed basically everybody, which means they are an elite team. Clemson's done the same except for the North Carolina game, but they don't get the benefit of the doubt, it seems, because we know their schedule is horrible. And Clemson fans, you know your schedule is horrible. And that doesn't mean that you're not elite. Last year, your schedule was not good. Not your fault. Uh, you were elite. Doesn't mean you played a good schedule. Um, Clemson ain't play nobody, Paul. But we, that's a known question mark of what they're going to do when they play a good team. Ohio State's played some good teams. But is it fair to say there's still a huge question mark around Ohio State because they have yet to play anybody even remotely close to Clemson's caliber? I think the most challenging thing when you're trying to compare Ohio State and Clemson is not so much looking at the schedule overall and the average quality of the teams that they played. It's really looking at if they've played anyone that is going to be a decent mirror for what they're going to play. Uh, in, in this bowl game. And and I don't even mean necessarily overall top end quality. I think the question is more about style. It's more about advantages and ability to operate certain plays and a certain style of football. Clemson's football this year is really based on a two prong attack. They have a vertical passing game that is very vertical. They throw a lot of downfield shots and they have an extremely athletic tailback that is able to execute his own scheme and able to make a lot of plays once you're spread out. The difficulty for most teams playing Clemson is that college corners are usually only so good. And Clemson has these six foot four receivers that they'll get on a pattern 40 yards downfield. And they also have this first round draft pick quarterback that can throw the ball with a tremendous amount of velocity and put the ball on the money downfield over your corner's head. And the receivers just take the ball over you. It's a little bit like playing Alshon Jeffrey over and over again. Um, but they, they really are all NFL ca caliber guys at that height and uh, with the athleticism that goes with it and the quarterback that can deliver it. I think Wisconsin showed a little bit with Cephas that they were going to throw downfield. Um, they were able to do a couple things with Ohio State, throwing the ball to Cephas, but Cone is not Trevor Lawrence. Cephas is not anywhere near the caliber of the Clemson players. I, I just don't think Ohio State has really faced a team that is built like Clemson. Um, maybe some of the teams you can say are really good. I think you can make an argument that Penn State's a really good team. I think you could make an argument that Wisconsin's a really good team. Um, one, I think you have to be careful in taking that argument too far and assuming just because they're a good team that, one, they're in any way uh, similar to Clemson. But something we talk about a lot on the show is football is about these breaking points. It's about these points where things start to break down or where things start to go really well for you. The thing that defined the Clemson-Alabama game last year was that Clemson had some deficiencies in the secondary and deficiencies in the pass rush. Um, they were problems for them throughout the season. They were devastating for them uh, in the game against Clemson. And I, if Ohio State were to have such issues, they wouldn't have shown up yet because of who they played. And I understand they have Chase Young. And I understand they have Akuda and Arnett and Ward. I mean, they have a lot of talent, but that talent has never had to play guys of this type. And more importantly, I think those guys may be great in particular coverage, but it's a different thing to face tall physical receivers in a different style of passing attack. Okay, so Ohio State hasn't played really an elite plus team this year, and most teams haven't. That are by the time you get the playoffs, most teams maybe have played one, maybe maybe two, but um, Clemson hasn't played a good team this year, and so if if we're talking about our concerns or our question marks. To me, it's, okay, Ohio State's been able to perform offensively against a good defense. Wisconsin has a good defense. Penn State's got a pretty good defense. Um, 
Clemson, on the other hand, has not faced a team with a good offense or a good defense. Like, a and M's okay uh, on both sides of the ball, but they're not elite or good on either. Um, tell me, are you more concerned for Clemson that they haven't played any? You can't prepare for that in practice, and they haven't really played anybody that has a good unit on either side of the ball. Obviously, it's a thing that should concern you a little bit more. So I think going into the year, the thing that was the most concerning about Clemson was run defense. Um, the defensive front is very talented, and they've got a lot of talented you know, talented depth. They don't necessarily have a lot of, let's say, quality experience depth at this point. Um, you know, they've, They're relying on freshmen into different positions. There's a lot of freshmen in, in the two and three deep. I think there were some guys that were thought that they were going to come in and you know set the world on fire that was maybe a little unrealistic or premature. Uh, K.J. Henry probably falls into that category. Um, guys that are exceptionally talented, but it you know it takes people time to develop on that front. They just aren't as old as they were before, um, and they and the guys they have that have seniority are not as talented as the group they just lost. Now, they've got a lot of fast twitch guys, guys like Xavier Thomas, guys like Isaiah Simmons that can be very disruptive. Those guys affect you more in the passing game, and they can affect you more in the run game. But the question was whether or not you're going to be able to lean on Clemson because their front, you know, maybe physically wasn't going to be as stout that maybe you could get push on them. I don't think they've really faced teams that have the ability to do that. And, you know, the, the North Carolina game, I think the story for that game for Clemson more than anything was that North Carolina averaged four yards a carry. Uh, in the next game against Florida State, they averaged about four and a half yards a carry. I think what we saw in that game against Clemson, and the thing that made them look you know, somewhat mortal, and they only gave up 20 points, was just the fact that North Carolina could run it. Ohio State is a completely different animal. Okay, So it, when you look at these teams and what they are in terms of rush offenses, um, you know, Boston College may be the best rush offense they faced. Boston College is 21st. Boston College also got completely shut down by Notre Dame and Virginia Tech in the run game. Um, but you look at other teams like, let's say, North Carolina. North Carolina is 57th uh, in yards per carry average. They're not a good rush attack. Um, so, you know, when when you're looking at, and I'm, I'm looking down this list right now, and when you're looking at, I think, Texas A&M at 47th is the second best rush offense you faced, you really haven't been tested. Uh, I'm one top 40 rush offense, and that one, Boston College, is probably a bit of mirage due to competition. I, I think it, there's a legitimate question with Ohio State's rush offense, which, uh, you know, if, if you're looking, they're number six. That's a completely different animal. And there's a chance that Ohio State can actually control the game on the ground against Clemson. And if they're able to do that, then a lot of the disruption and athleticism that Clemson has and those advantages could start to fall to the wayside. Again, a lot like we were talking about with Ohio State and the receiving court Clemson and how they affect things, you know, maybe Ohio State is able to move the ball in Clemson in such a way that it negates a lot of the defensive advantages that Clemson's enjoyed throughout the season. There's so much emphasis on, especially outside linebackers, defensive ends, they can get to the quarterback, that you give up something in the run game. And unless you have just incredible middle linebackers and a good interior defensive line, it really puts you in a bad spot. LSU, we've talked about this multiple times, LSU has done a lot to retool their defense, their front seven, um, because they were getting killed last year in the run game, and it's really affected how they get to the passer. Um, one of the things we haven't really talked about yet and we need to talk about is – we don't know really where Justin Fields is in terms of health and ability to run. We saw him move enough against Wisconsin to know that if he has to run, he can run. But it's also unclear, especially with the time off, because the time off, he might be you know right as rain, but it's unclear if that offense scheme-wise is going to be limited because he's maybe not running as well how big of an issue is this given that we have seen him in a game? We've seen him in a game since the injury, even if it's mild. So we know that he can at least move, move a little bit. I think it's really substantial. Uh, and it was really when fields got warmed up and got a little healthier that they moved the ball better against Wisconsin. They struggled a little bit early and I think they struggled because they were trying to limit 
Fields exposure. I mean, that, that offense is built around the zone read because, and I've said this a thousand times over the course of the season, I'll say it again, Ohio State's biggest strength is that Fields has a very live arm. They have very fast, good receivers. They split those receivers really wide, and then they use the entirety of the field. And it's difficult to stay with Ohio State's receivers, especially especially on the long developing deep routes that they use and the throws they make to the boundary, which all leverage Fields' arm strength. And then when you're that spread out, not to be able to deal with Fields as a runner in J.K. Dobbins because they're doing that zone read concept, which means you're basically getting a free blocker out of that. And now if a linebacker takes the wrong angle, the safeties in the corners are way too spread out to deal with it, and you end up with huge run plays. Um, If Fields can't run the ball, that lets you focus on Dobbins and run a traditional defense. You can actually take the linebacker and follow Dobbins if he goes in a pass route or follow Dobbins on his own read concept and just assume that the defensive line can handle fields or at least that you can handle him somewhat schematically. Um, And then you can play more traditional defense. It's a lot harder when there's a mesh. It's a lot harder when you're basically down a guy against that zone read. And that's the thing that really would let Ohio State kind of sort of neutralize Simmons. Um, Simmons is a phenomenal football player. But... If you can isolate him either outside in the pass or in the run game, use reads to get him where he's having to take some responsibility, then you can just make sure the ball goes some other way, and then you'll never really get him involved. Um, It's something we've seen a lot of teams do this year that have been very high-level offenses. We talked about it a lot with uh, Delpit in in the um, LSU-Alabama game, and I think it proved true. Alabama avoided Delpit like the plague, and they were able to do it. Um, and I think Ohio State would love to do that with Simmons, but it's a heck of a lot easier if the quarterback can run the ball because it's that it's one more responsibility somebody has to fill, um, and, and that means you don't have somebody that can spy because schematically you can't get away with it. All right, so let's do a little bit of unit versus unit. A lot of people like to compare. This team might have a better run game than the other team. I want to do it in the context of what they're facing. So let's start with this, and I don't necessarily – like. Another thing that people like to do with unit discussion is run game versus front seven. Well, a lot of teams are using safeties in the run game, and a lot of teams have liability with with cover corners who can't tackle. So I'm going to make it easy for everybody. Clemson's run game versus Ohio State's run defense, let's go. I think Clemson's run game is at a disadvantage against Ohio State's run defense. Um, and I I do too. And I think that's fair. And when you look at what Clemson has done – in these big games, even the ones they won, the the you know shocker last year against Alabama and the other big Alabama games, they have not run the ball well in those games. They haven't run them well in almost any uh, of those games. And I don't really expect it to be different here. Uh, I mean, 4.3 yards per carry is a solid outing last year against Alabama. Now, that was 4.3 yards per carry, most of it late. That's still not anything near the like 6.5 that they were averaging in that season. The in the year prior, in twenty, it was the same thing against Notre Dame too. It was both games, if I remember correctly. Etienne broke off a late run after the game was over that took his yards per carry average from something in the high twos, low threes into the fours or fives. And because we we like to just look at box scores, because you know, Josh, we don't watch the games. We don't ever watch the games. We just look at box scores. Um, and. One of the things that people always bring up is, well, ETN had a good game here, you know, in the playoffs. That's not necessarily the case. Alabama, for all of their struggles last year against Clemson, they did shut down that run game. So I, I do think it's a fair point, um, and I'll let you continue now that I've interrupted. Yeah, no, it's fine. And it, and you gave me a second to pull up the stat, but looking past the past few years again in uh, postseason play, Clemson was three point eight yards per carry against Alabama in twenty fifteen. yards per carry in their win in 2016. 2017, they were 1.9 yards per carry against Alabama, uh, and they were 1.9 yards per carry in the conference championship against Miami. So there is a very significant track record that Clemson's rush offense is going to struggle against a top-end rush defense. They have pretty much the entirety of Swift's career, and even before Swift's career with this style of offense. The question is going to be whether they can throw the ball, but in terms of running it, um, I will honestly be surprised if they're able to consistently get over a four yard per carry mark. The thing I like about Etienne, though, is I don't think he's not a grinder. He's not Jonathan Taylor. He's not a typical like SEC running back. 
but he is somebody that can go two yards of carry, two yards of carry, take it to the house. And that's what you always have with him. And that's one thing, one of the things I like about him. What people don't realize is this is the thing that comes into play to Clemson's benefit. It worked really well last year where everybody was so worried about their run game last year because that's what they showed all season. And then they come out against Alabama and they're chucking it all over the field. You get the benefit of doing that in the ACC when you don't play anybody, and that's not a shot at Clemson. It is just reality about the ACC. SEC teams, when they play crappy SEC teams, they can run. Even good SEC teams, good Big Ten teams who play mediocre conference opponents can run where that run game won't scale against a good defense. All right, let's do Ohio State's run game against Clemson's run defense. Notice I didn't say Clemson. I said Clemson. He's, he's worked very hard on that, y'all. You should uh, you should tell him you're very grateful. Um, I think this is the probably the area where Ohio State has the best chance to make inroads. And I've already talked enough about it that I don't want to waste too much more time. But you know, Clemson lost a historic group on that front. You know, three first rounders. I think. You know, we we always use Alabama as a benchmark, so I kind of hate it. But I think this the stat I figured out was it was as many first rounders as Alabama had in eight years is what Clemson lost last year, and they're just not quite where they were. Um, they're very disruptive and active, uh, but they can be pushed around. And Ohio State's offensive line has been very effective for most of the season. Um, everybody has some hiccups, but generally they've been pretty dominant. I combine that with fields, combine that with JK Dobbins. I think there is the possibility that Ohio state could actually bully Clemson a little bit uh, on the front. And if they're able to do that, I think they could have some success running the ball. All right, let's go Ohio state's passing game versus Clemson's pass defense. I am not overly bullish about Ohio state's passing game versus Clemson's pass defense. Um, in the past, we have seen some glitches from Clemson uh, on the defensive side of the ball. Their safety play has not always been up to par. Um, this year, you know, Tanner Muse was thought to be something of a weak point, and you can see maybe athletically, maybe he's a bit limited, but he's been very effective. Um, AJ Terrell is a top shelf corner. Uh, Kendrick has, you know, former five star player that's also turned into a top shelf corner. Uh, Wallace is very good. They're, they're sound, and more importantly, they have extremely good pass rushers. Now, Fields is, gives up a tremendous number of sacks, right? So when you combine Clemson's ability to get ru- to rush the passer and Clemson's ability to cover, I think that sort of overwhelms what Ohio State's able to do. And I know how Ohio State has great receivers. I know Fields is a good quarterback, and he is a very good quarterback. But I just don't think, particularly in passing downs, Ohio State's not going to have an advantage here. It's going to be difficult for Ohio State to throw the ball effectively in a third and ten. I think they want to avoid that situation almost at all costs. And so we're going to go to Clemson, Clemson's pass game versus Ohio State's pass defense. And I want you to touch on, so a lot of people are going to refer to last season against Alabama, last season against Notre Dame, but especially Alabama, because that was really Trevor Lawrence's coming out on a huge stage, uh, Justin Ross too. Um, but I want to get, I want you to give, Look at this through the lens of what Alabama had defensively last year, especially at corner. Um, They were injured a good bit. Give Ohio State fans a little bit of a primer um, for why we might not see the same Clemson bombs away offense, and they're going to have to change it up a little bit. And then through that, tell me how you think they'll fare against this Ohio State defense. So uh, try to give the 90-second story of it. Alabama was in a very unusual and uncomfortable situation in their pass rush and in their pass co- pass defense. Now, big caveat here, you're trying to win a national title, you don't get to use this as an excuse. It just is what you are, and it told the story of the tape. But it did sort of define the way that game went, and in terms of projecting this game, it's important to understand why it happened the way it did. Alabama had lost Terrell Lewis to the season in preseason. They lost the backup outside linebacker, also, and then they, they had one more outside linebacker that was a quality player in Christian Miller. Um, they also had Anthony Jennings, who was on and off, but he's not a pass rusher. In the Oklahoma game, Christian Miller goes down to injury. And without him, they did not have an actual pass rusher left on the roster. All they had were their typical players, 
no one that is a designated pass rusher, and I say that'd be no true outside linebacker pass rushers, uh, period. They they did not have one. I mean, they had a couple like freshman options, I think, and they didn't really ever use them. Um, further, the secondary situation was pretty pretty bad. Um, Trevon Diggs, who's projected to be a high ra- dra- high round draft pick this year, um, also got injured in midseason. They started playing uh, Savion Smith. Savion Smith got abused a little bit in the Oklahoma game, which was a precursor, and then certainly by Clemson, and was not a physical player, was not a consistent player. Um, he ended up going, I think went pro early and got undrafted. I think I remember remember that happening. Um, and he ends up getting hurt himself halfway through the game. Uh, then they have to play a true freshman that has almost never played before, um, and he gets abused. And that true freshman came back, was expected to be a starter for Alabama, and he got benched after the first game because he gave up a lot of yards to Duke, and he never saw the field this year. Um, so the point being that Clemson's downfield passing attack, we were never able to see this year how much of it was due to Alabama and how much was due to Clemson, which was kind of a shame. But there is a definite argument that Clemson's success was at least 75% due to Alabama being wholly deficient at pass rush on one side of the field at corner. And that might actually be the story as much as it was Clemson. We don't really know um, because Clemson really hasn't been tested to, to find that out. But they didn't have Okuda and Chase Young back there to, to make a difference, and that's the key. Um, tell me, so based on all of that, you're having to make a guess but tell me what you think, Clemson's pass offense versus, versus Ohio State. I think their passing offense will be effective. I, I do think there is – what happened in that championship game I think was kind of two signs to a coin. It was Alabama's deficiencies and, uh, and Clemson being really, really good. And I think um, Clemson, if they weren't that good, would not have exposed Alabama. And I think if Alabama wasn't that deficient, they wouldn't have given up 44 points. Maybe they only give up 30. Um, still lose the game. Ohio State is a lot more sound. They, they've got sound corners all around. They're able to play good coverage. They're able to, to stay close to guys. They have a real pass rush, not just Chase Young. They have a lot of uh, talent and athleticism. The interior guys like Hamilton and Cornell are able to push the pocket. Um, guys like uh, Borland and Harrison are also very active players, and they can move them around and do a lot of interesting things. If I were to give a criticism, it's that I, I haven't felt like Ohio State's secondary has – necessarily always been as physical as they should be. Um, Clemson's an interesting and almost unique matchup. I mean, their receivers are massive guys, uh, and they're very fast and very large, and they get a lot of they do a lot of stuff with hand fighting, getting arms on guys, getting extension. And sometimes corners that are really good at staying in coverage can struggle because now they're playing jump balls. Now they're getting a guy that's pushing off a little bit. And I will tell you in the playoffs, they're going to push off and they're going to get away with it because te- in these big games, they don't call many fouls. So they're going to get let them do a lot of hand fighting. It's probably the only game all year where that hand fighting is going to benefit the offense more than the defense that Ohio State's played. Uh, and I will say the past couple years, at times, Ohio State secondary, I felt like, has gotten pushed around a little bit by physical receivers. So while I do think, especially given the pass rush, Ohio State is probably going to have the, quote, advantage on Clemson, I don't think they're going to be able to shut it down either. I think Clemson is going to get some big plays. Um, And if nothing else is working, I think Clemson is going to be able to score points, throwing jump balls, even if they can't do so nearly as consistently as they did last year. So I think this is probably a good point to go ahead and transition into the model. Uh, I've spoken enough, and if you guys can't hear, part of the reason we're late uh, Josh completely, completely lost his voice the past couple weeks. Um, so I'm trying to speak third person. Nice. Yes. Third person. Well, that's where I'm at right now. Um, I'm doing the best I can guys to try to keep talking. It's a little difficult. Um, I think the model is amazingly close and as a slight preview to all the games we're currently have modeled, this has been the most competitive year in a bowl game situation that we've seen. Um, it should come to no surprise to everybody that the first like statistic we try to generate is that percentage of opponent average is allowed, which just means if your opponent average four yards per carry and you allow three, you allow 75% of their average. Both these defenses are excellent. Uh, Ohio State a little bit better against the run than the pass. Clemson's been a little bit better against the pass than the run. Both are hovering right around the 70% mark. Um, you can pretty much just call it margin for error, uh, if you will, or uh, you know, garb. Both these teams have faced a lot of garbage time, but I will also say 
both these teams have been more dominant in garbage time in a per play sense than they actually have been in regulation. So I'd be a little careful and, you know, poo pooing that too much. Um, these are very good offenses, but they're better defenses. Uh, and you know, both teams averaging around six yards per carry, both teams averaging over eight and a half yards per attempt. Um, I think the, the notable thing here though, is that the defenses are so good on both sides of the ball that they kind of trump the offensive production And the models projection here is basically that both teams will run it some and neither team will be able to throw it very well for 4.05 yard per carry roughly, um, within, uh, one one hundredth of a yard different. Um, well, one point five one hundredths of a yard different between the two teams in the rush projection. So pretty darn even. Um, and then both teams are projected to have six point four yards per attempt. So almost, almost a dead even projection. Ohio State expected to get five point oh seven yards per play. Uh, Clemson five point one seven, uh, a tenth of a yard separating these two teams in the model. And it's unsurprising given that that the score differential is non-existent. Twenty set it's twenty-eight to twenty-seven Clemson, but if you want to get more specific, it's actually within a half y- uh, half a point. It's twenty-seven point four to twenty-seven point eight five. Um, this is a darn close game, um, and essentially what it's saying: these two teams have been effectively equally dominant against their competition. Um, more dominant defensively than offensively, so it projects a low-scoring game where they're very evenly matched. And right now, Clemson's sitting at a two-point favorite. It's interesting that they came out around a two-point favorite, and it really hasn't moved much. Um, so I, I'm not surprised that that's the model is right in line with Vegas. It is tough. We're having to compare across conferences, and that's when the model really sometimes chokes because these – Teams, especially the Big Ten, didn't play a lot of marquee OFC games, out of conference games, Power Five games, um, and Clemson didn't play anybody in conference. So it's really hard, but um, it's it's close. I'm having a hard time picking this one because of the question marks. It's not just question marks of like, oh, this team might suck because that's what we have in September. This is the question mark of, oh, both of these teams are elite. Is there a unit that can get exposed? Because that's where we're, we are right now because of who they played. I'm going to go ahead and get my pick. Um, right now, I, I love Ohio State this year. I love them. I am super scared that they haven't faced an elite quarterback. They haven't faced an elite offense. It's tough because I love J.K. Dobbins. I love what Fields has done, and I really like that Ohio State defense. But what I see is, and I don't really fault them a whole lot for the Wisconsin game. That was a that was a groggy, sleepy first half for them, and a lot of things went Wisconsin's way. But I do wonder if if Wisconsin's got a real quarterback and a real set of wide receivers. I wonder what that game looks like with a team that could keep scoring. I wonder. So. For those reasons, I am going to pick Clemson in the unknown of unknowns, 26-21. Tell me what you got. So as you said, picking in this game, it's almost impossible because of the relative difference in the teams. And, you know, this is a stat, you know, we tweet out sometimes at at CFB nerds. And I feel like sometimes we get good stats, even if stats are boring against teams with a winning record. Okay. The big 12 was two and one. The ACC was one and six. There's two keys there. One, the ACC showed that they, when they played teams with a winning record, they lost out of conference. These are P five teams playing against P five conference teams with a winning record. But two, the Big Ten only paced three teams out of conference with a winning record. They did not play anyone. Um, That's not to say they were bad. They had a winning record in those games, but they only had three of them. Um, And all three of them, I should say, were seven-win teams. There were, uh, I think, Iowa State, Pitt, and I'm drawing a blank on the third one. Um, uh, Notre Dame. Well, no, not Cincinnati. Not Notre Dame, not Cincinnati, because they're not P5 conferences. Uh, It was Arizona State, I believe. Um, So... 
it's really hard. And as we said, our model is mostly looking at the data of what happened based off how you played, but you only played your own conference. And when the data points are this isolated, there is no way for me to control for it. I cannot, you know, other than really overcompensating for these games. And I'll, I'll note again, I'd be really overcompensating for things like, you know, maybe how, um, Michigan state did against Arizona state. And that's not a reflection on Ohio state at all, or, or similarly how the ACC is not a reflection on Clemson. So your stats are kind of on an island, almost as if you were looking at a European soccer league versus an African soccer league. You, you just kind of can't do it. Um, that said, I'm going to take Ohio State in this one, and I'm going to take it close. I'm going to say 31-28. That is dependent on Fields being effective as a runner. I think if Fields cannot run the ball, I don't think Ohio State is going to win this game. I think the two-point spread is about right. Um, a two-point spread, If for those that aren't aware, that really means this game's like 55-45. It's Anything under a field goal is effectively a pick em. It's less than a 60% chance either way. Vegas does not think there's a clear favorite. But I, I do think if, if Fields is healthy, to me the key in the game, I think Ohio State is going to be able to spread out Clemson. And I think Clemson's linebackers, while solid players, I don't think are quite of the talent caliber of some of the other parts of their team. Skalski and Smith, I think, can be exposed a little bit. And if Ohio State is able to spread them out and really run against those guys in the zone read um, and keep Simmons out of the box as much as possible, um, I think they can do exactly what they did against Wisconsin. I've commented that's how Ohio State beat Wisconsin, and I think it'd be the same game plan here. They would do enough to keep them honest otherwise, focus on that one matchup, isolate it, and try to win it. That would be Ohio State's key to success, but it only works if Justin Fields can actually run the ball. So we do this from time to time, and I think it's worth doing now. We've both got this game close. If this game is high scoring, like in the 40s, who do you think that favors and why? It's a bit tough to say, but I would say if it's high scoring, it's probably going to favor Clemson. I think in a high scoring game, Teams with, it, it, I, I have a hard time believing that Ohio State's going to get to a high-scoring game by being able to throw the ball over the yard. And I think if Clemson is in a high-scoring game, they're going to be more comfortable in that situation, throwing the ball in high-pressure situations where they know they've got a score to win. Um, and they have the ability with their receiving core to just keep throwing punch after punch after punch. And I don't think Ohio State would be as comfortable in that situation. I know Ohio State has put up a ton of points in a lot of games, but they did it in situations where they were up on somebody and they were able to lean on the run and just pop one and then pop one and then pop one. I don't think that's how a game is ever going to go and against an elite team. You're pretty much going to, if it's high scoring, it's going to be passing um, when you're facing really good football teams. And I don't think Ohio State's going to be as comfortable in that situation. So you picked Ohio State to win this game. We've seen some – we've discussed both about how Ohio State has looked mortal. They look mortal against Wisconsin. They look mortal against Penn State. Those two games, how much do those two games influence your score here? Like if Ohio State blew out Penn State and Wisconsin, would you have this a 10-point spread? Or do you think Clemson is that good that irrespective of what happened in those games, you'd still have this really tight score? I would probably have this more like a 10 point spread. Uh, Ohio State showed that they can be slowed down. And to a certain point in the year, Ohio State did not look like a college team was going to really be able to stop them. It's true. And, and then, then they showed they could. I've seen team Texas A&M game. People talk about the North Carolina game. But Clemson struggled to score against Texas A&M too. And Clemson struggled even like the first half against Syracuse. There were times where Clemson was slowed down. That really just didn't happen to Ohio State until the very end of the year. Um, and But when it did happen, it didn't look like a fluke. It looked like there were ways to slow Ohio State down. If you were an elite unit, and Clemson is an elite unit, and I, I mean, I 100% believe that's why the line swung the way it did. Just, I mean, not to say that Ohio State is a huge underdog. I mean, they're a two-point dog. So you normally... I normally ask you for a parting shot, but I'm going to give my parting shot, my thoughts on this. Um, we haven't done our, our Oklahoma LSU game yet. 
But this is the 2 3 game, and it's going to be my favorite game of the year by far. I have so much interest in this game because I think there's a chance that the winner of this game comes out and just smokes somebody in the championship game. I'm, I'm not saying that that's what I'm going to call for or even how I'm going to predict that game when we when we do a preview on it, but something in my gut tells me that there's a chance that this is the 2-3 game and it should have been the 1-2 game. Um, just how everything shook out this year, especially if Claude edwards Hilaire can't play. Um, so I, I think that Ohio State fans are going to be a little bit frustrated because we've been on the Ohio State train all year and we started this video out with a little bit of negativity. But it's really just because now we're talking about two elite teams playing each other and we're going to kind of pick them apart. And Ohio State hasn't really played that elite team this year. And Clemson fans, this is why Clemson fans for the last few years haven't liked us because we have this elite expectation for them. So we have to talk about what our potential flaws in them, even if they're the best team in the country. Otherwise, it's boring. It's boring to get on here and say, oh, you're just going to kill everybody. That's that's no fun. Um, there are legitimate flaws for any team ever in the college football history. And Ohio State fans are finally getting that taste from us this year. It's not because we hate your team. It's not because we're down on your team. I love Ohio State this year. Um, I picked Clemson just because I, I think that they're really rounding into form right now. And I think they've got a lot of experience from guys who weren't experienced in the beginning of the season. My only concern, and I, I say this as my final thing, you gave the caveat of if Justin Fields can't run, then they probably don't win the game. I give the caveat of if the Trevor Lawrence we saw at the beginning of the year only improved as a product of the schedule and not because of him kind of changing who he is, and he turns out to be interception prone and to be a little bit shaky, which he was for the first four-ish games of the year, then I could see Ohio State winning and winning comfortably. I don't think that's who he is. Um, I'm putting my faith in the fact that that was just early season rust. But those performances, seven, six and a half yards per carry, multiple interceptions against trash defenses, it's not a good look. So it is there. But for now, I've got confidence in Clemson. I think they win this game. All right, y'all, that's going to be it for our preview. Thanks for waiting. We had to take a break. We had family stuff. We had everybody in the world was sick. Um, but we are loving this discussion. And we're going to continue it with other previews, not just the other playoff game. But we're going to do a lot of bowl previews. So y'all keep an eye on that. And please... Remember, like and subscribe. We get a lot more views than we have subscribers, which means some of you knuckleheads hadn't hit that subscribe button yet. So go ahead and hit it. It helps the channel out a whole lot. And obviously, if you want to share us on Tiger Net or Eleven Warriors or the you know Rivals channel as well, um, it helps us out a whole lot. Sharing helps us out a whole lot. Uh, also, comment and give us your score. Let us know what you think. Thanks so much, y'all. Have a great week. God bless. Thank you.